Good afternoon. The next item of business. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. On a point of order, Deputy Presiding Officer, on Tuesday this week, the Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution was asked by my colleague Oliver Mundell in the Chamber what the proposed date would be for his party's illegal Skexit referendum. He declined to give a specific answer, even though he knew full well that he was proposing to hold it in October 2023, as he revealed in a media interview the next day. In fact, it was on Good Morning Scotland on BBC Radio Scotland. Presiding officer, Deputy Presiding Officer, I have lost count of the number of times you have asked the Scottish Government to make significant announcements to the Parliament in the first instance and not to the media. Now, despite the Minister for Parliamentary Business's conclusion that Tuesday's last-minute referendum announcement was not significant, it did contain a very significant policy announcement. Indeed, the Scottish Government have made it their normal practice to willfully ignore Parliament and choose instead to run the country through media appearances and spend. Deputy Presiding Officer, do you view this as being in order? And if not, what can we do as parliamentarians to heighten scrutiny on a government that, that doesn't even attempt to disguise the disrespect and disregard it has for the Scottish Parliament? I, I thank the member for his point of order. It is the case that announcements on important matters should be made to the Parliament before they are released to the media. The intended date of a referendum is, of course, a matter of interest to this Parliament. Members will be aware that the First Minister has indicated that she will provide an update to the Parliament before recess, and I hope that no further information appears elsewhere before this update is provided. Thank you. I would now like to move on to the next item of business, which is Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body Questions. Uh, and uh, should any member wish to ask a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question or enter the letter R in the chat function. And succinct questions and answers would, of course, be much appreciated. I call question number one, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body, as an employer located in the zone, how it will help to meet the objectives of the Edinburgh Low Emission Zone. Maggie Chapman. I thank Mark Raskell for that question. The Edinburgh Low Emission Zone was introduced by Edinburgh Council in May 2022. Those travelling to the Parliament will go through the LEZ. The objectives of the LEZ are cleaner air, healthier people and active travel options. The Scottish Parliament has a sustainable travel plan which encourages active travel and lower carbon emissions from commuter, business and visitor travel to the Scottish Parliament building. Walking, cycling and public transport are all encouraged and over 80% of regular building users use one of these as their main mode of transport. We do provide secure bike storage and changing facilities, interest-free bike loans, which includes for electric bikes and bike maintenance facilities. We have, in place, we have plans in place to encourage more car sharing rather than individual journeys and we are investing in electric charging points in our car park. We currently have 16 and we have plans to increase this. Mark Ruskell. Uh, can I thank the member for that response? Um, today is uh, obviously Clean Air Day and it's really important that the Parliament as an institution takes the lead on tackling what is a huge public health crisis that's killing thousands of people every year. Um, I really welcome uh, what the member has laid out in terms of the work the Parliament's doing as a cycle-friendly employer. Um, but will the SPCB also look at the allowances system um, so, for example, should it, be, should it be right that the Parliament should reimburse mileage claims for journeys within low emission zones that are taken in cars that are actually banned under the regulations that this very Parliament has approved? Maggie Chapman. I thank Mark Ruskell for that supplementary. And I, I think that's an interesting idea and especially something that we, we should be considering given our net zero ambitions. Um, I think it's something that the corporate body and parliament as a whole can certainly consider. We currently base reimbursement on HM HMRC rates set out in legislation, so we would need to see what is possible and what changes could be made, if any, to our scheme. I do undertake, though, to raise this at forthcoming corporate body meetings and consider whether we can incentivise members to shift away from using carbon emitting vehicles, including those that would be charged under the LEZ scheme. Question number two, Brian Whistle. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, when it last reviewed the requirements for members to access legal services funded through the Members Expense Scheme, in order to ascertain whether the current criteria are fit for purpose. Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I thank Brian Whittle for his question, and can I begin by acknowledging that I understand the particular circumstance that he has been facing as an MSP and the discussions he's had with me and with the corporate body, and that these remain ongoing. In general terms, can I say that the corporate body reviews the reimbursement of members' expenses scheme each parliamentary session to ensure that it does remain fit for purpose. We last reviewed the scheme in 2019, and there were revisions to the scheme introduced at the beginning of this session. In addition, the corporate body also has a legal advice scheme for members, which is separate to the members' expense scheme, and it was last reviewed in 2016. Now, neither of you highlighted any need for a change to the underlying principles or criteria for access to legal services, and the operation of both schemes has demonstrated that their scope is sufficient to address the needs of a high majority of members, while we understand and accept that particular circumstances can arise where the corporate body scheme does not, um, and there are opportunities for members to consider one-off applications to the corporate body in those circumstances. Brian Whittle. I thank Jackson Carlow for that answer. As he alluded to, he is aware of the situation that, uh, that I, I have been facing. And I say that it comes to my attention that the current legal services provision for members is only available to defend a member if a legal action is taken against them and does not support a member taking legal action to recover funds paid to a third party through the scheme if a dispute occurs. This effectively means that in the event of, say, a landlord not returning a deposit or a contractor failing to rectify an issue with a product after it has been paid for, a member cannot, if necessary, pursue a court action to recover public funds. I wonder if the corporate body believes this is an acceptable situation. And if not, will I agree to review the position on the future provision of legal services? Jackson Carlo. I am sympathetic, as are the corporate body, to the particular situation in which the member has, has found himself. Uh, it is, however, we understand the only time that such an experience has been uh, uh, felt or, or, or circumstanced by a, a member. And therefore, there isn't a view in the corporate body at the moment that there needs to be a much wider review of the scheme in consequence. Uh, however, as I said earlier, there is the opportunity for an exceptional uh, application to be made to the corporate body where that is felt to be appropriate. Question number three, Jim Fairley. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like to ask the Scottish corporate parliament and the corporate body what steps it's taken to ensure the availability of Scottish produce on the menu in the Scottish Parliament. Maggie Chapman. <coughs> Can I thank Jim Fairley for that question? The catering services at the Scottish Parliament are provided through our contract with Sodexo. We monitor the percentage of fresh Scottish produce used in our services, and last year approximately 60% of fresh produce was used by our services that was produced in Scotland. <coughs> Excuse me. We invite many of our suppliers in to showcase their produce on site and to speak to members and staff directly. This is perhaps most notable during Scottish Food and Drink Fortnight, which we participate in annually. We regularly support and organise events on site that promote Scottish produce. Last month, we held our Scotland in Spring dining evening in the Holyrood Room, showcasing seasonal produce such as accredited Scottish lamb, locally grown berries and asparagus. Jim Fairley. I'd like to thank you for the answer. Uh, can I ask the Scottish Parliament and corporate body how it is monitoring the carbon footprint, including food miles from its sourcing and product supply? Michael Chapman. Can I thank Jim Felly for, for that information? We do uh, have a carbon auditing and, and, and carbon, monitoring, carbon monitoring as part of all of our Scottish Parliament uh, operations. I can, uh, I'll undertake to write to the member with more, more details about the specific uh, processes for, for our food and drink. Question number four, Eleanor Wisdom. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether an assessment has been made of the chairs and the MSP block for use by members and staff in relation to occupational health and the latest standards. Christine Graham. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I thank the member for a question. Our office furniture contracts require suppliers to ensure chairs meet all relevant standards in force at the time of purchase. We inspect chairs at regular intervals to make sure they remain in safe condition and replace them when they reach the end of life. If a member or a member of staff feels that they require support for a particular health concern, they can contact the People and Culture Office, formerly HR, for support. If necessary, a workplace assessment can be arranged with our occupational health provider. 
I thank Christine Graham for her answer and would ask if we could seek a further update as to the date of purchase, as I'm sure she will appreciate humans factor engineering and ergonomics as an ever changing and evolving discipline. Thank you. Christine Graham. Uh, I, thank, I thank the member for the supplementary. I don't have to hand the date of actual purchase, and I don't even know if they were all purchased at the same time. I'll endeavour to uh, find this out and to write to the member advising. But in the meantime, chairs are replaced if they do not pass an inspection, and this is in line with our environmental policy. Question number five, Natalie Dunn. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether it will provide an update on the reopening of the Scottish Parliament crash. Maggie Chapman. Can I thank Natalie Don for that question? In March of this year, the Scottish Parliament Corporate Body agreed to procure a new provider to re-establish and run the on-site crash facility here at Holyrood. The decision was taken in order to maintain our commitment to accessibility and continue to provide childcare for visitors and pass holders to the building who have young children. Officials have completed all the procurement requirements and are ready to go out to market later this month. A corporate body expect to award the contract in October this year, October 22. In line with Care Inspectorate guidance, we have allowed for a six-month mobilisation period and intend the new service, therefore, to open in spring 2023. Natalie Dunn. Uh, thank you for that answer. As the corporate body is aware, the provision of a high-quality crash service in the building allows MSPs, parliamentary staff and visitors the childcare facilities they require to perform their duties. So as we return from a long period of hybrid working, we need to ensure that staff and members are supported fully with this transition. As a new member and a mother to young children, the crash has not been in use since I was elected over 12 months ago. So can the corporate body advise what efforts have been made to prioritise the re-implementation of this service? Can I thank Natalie Don for, for, for her supplementary? We have had detailed conversations about this at Corporate Body, and one of the challenges we had was because of lockdown and because of the closure of, of, of the Parliament at the start of the pandemic, the crash service was, was ceased. Um, changes to uh, care inspectorate uh, reg uh, and guidance means that we've had to change as well how the crash operates, which, which is why we need to go out to retender for that. And I, I understand and appreciate the difficulties that has, that has caused uh, her and, and perhaps some other members as well in, in the last year or so. But we are hoping to have a contract um, a, a, a approved in October this year and the crash up and running by spring next year. Question number six, Stephen Kerr. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether it has explored the possibility of creating apps for parliamentary functions. Maggie Chapman. I thank Stephen Kerr for that question. The Parliament already provides a few mobile-friendly applications and services to support members in their roles and to support parliamentary business. Examples of these include the Questions and Motions mobile application, which, allow, which allows members to raise questions and to raise and support motions at any time and from any location on any device with a browser and internet connection. Also, the digital voting application was developed and delivered along with other aspects of a hybrid parliament in response to the pandemic to ensure that members could continue to participate in parliamentary business using mobile devices from wherever they had internet access. Officials are in the early stages of work to understand how we can improve the digital delivery of information and services to members, and input from members has been and will continue to be sought to ensure that this work is a success. Stephen Kerr. Well, what I'm talking about is actual apps. Now, I'm supposed to uh, put money in a jar uh, whenever I mention Westminster, uh, according, to my, <laughs> according to my staff. Um, <laughs> there should be quite a lot of money in that jar, I can tell you. But down south, there are excellent standalone apps, actual apps, which enhance the functions of Parliament. And we should have this too at the Scottish Parliament. Business papers, spice briefings, broadcast footage, questions, motions, voting records, and even division bell push notifications could be included as features in such a set of apps. Sadly, our current reliance on web apps or email notifications is outdated and they are simply not as effective as standalone apps. So can I ask the corporate body, do they accept that moves in this direction would make Parliament more accessible for both Holyrood staff and, more importantly, the voters who keep us here? And are they open to looking into the proposal further? Maggie Chapman. 
can I thank Stephen Kerr for, for his supplementary? We are more than open uh, to input fr from you, fr yes. from members and, and from others, as we start to look at exactly what information members need to carry out their business and what information should be available and in what forms for, for members of, of, of the public. Traditionally, we have produced apps which can run on any device rather than specific apps for Apple or Android devices. There are significant cost-saving reasons for this. Being able to run uh, apps, applications off a web-based platform means that we don't need to maintain relationships with individual app providers, and tendering of those individual apps can be significantly expensive, much more costly than a, a, a web-based version. But we will, we will take his comments, the, the members' comments on board, and we, we will include those as part of our conversations as we discuss how we further develop the, the support we provide. Thank you, Ms Chapman. That concludes Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body questions, and there will be a very short pause before we move to the next item of business. Thank you.